right, so um, when I noticed, and that was actually very recently, um, quite recently, that my name was on the program of this event twice, um, and uh, for the first event it said Sebastian Lutger text.com, um, I thought, okay, I'm going to do something fully historic for this session. Um, the day after tomorrow, Jan and me are going to talk uh, a lot more about what we're doing currently. It's much more interesting, it's much more kind of uh, uh, sophisticated, but just by looking at this old stuff I'm going to present, I was just appalled how, 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 how uh, infantile and idiotic a lot of this is technically. But um, so if you want to know about new stuff, uh, there's another thing uh, the day after tomorrow, but um, I'm going to show some old stuff now, because it's also kind of funny, Texacom hasn't existed for, I think, about seven, six to seven years. And to still be invited as a uh, text.com, it's like as if you had someone from Alta Vista here. <laughs> Ooh, what's that? Um, uh, in a way, ARG has not just replaced text.com, but does so much more than text.com did. It was text.com was very different. It was so much smaller, and it didn't have that kind of that whole uh, uh, idea of of, uh, of a social, of a meaningful social, of communication, of users, of an actual community and meaningful activity in that community around it. Text.com was just, I mean, it was back in 1999 or 2000 when you could just register a five-letter .com and be the CEO of that. Text.com was more actually something I did personally for myself to piss certain people off. I think that was the big kind of... Uh, uh, there's, a, there, there's one thing that's interesting in the site uh, text.com logs. There's a log files. No one has ever seen them. Um, it's still... a to, to now the most popular thing I've ever done on the internet, because um, at the time it was shortly shortly after Napster, it was an extremely uh, so there was this kind of it was definitely not the first wave, but one of these big waves of millions of people realizing at the same time that internet can be used for means that are really interesting and that don't require a lot of state intervention or control that just happen by networking relatively spontaneously. Um, and so text.com was just a website that hosted text files. I just read in the other place it had 10,000 texts. This is not true. Maybe it had a tenth of that. It was all very much hand-picked. It was text I owned. More than half of it was available online anyway. It was just a collection of things. It was a bit idiosyncratic. I hope it was interesting. It was just a HTML website that had and text files on the, on, the, on the site. Plus a manifesto that tried to be, be a bit grandiose. And if you read it today, it was kind of like the spirit of the time, inspired on the one side definitely by Napster, um, and on the other hand maybe by this kind of tone of uh, Barlow's declaration of independence of cyberspace, where it says like, you governments, you weary, weary giants of flash and steel, get the fuck off the internet. It's our space, you don't govern here, we can do a lot of interesting stuff. So, um, one of the, so text.com, uh, it was, just, it was it wasn't easy to remember domain. It's got a lot of users, and I think I just wanted to demonstrate. I want I want to do two things, and the first thing is to demonstrate why um, why it was fun to do it. So um, just one particular case. Uh, the first time I think Texacom got into legal trouble of some sort. So in 2002 there was a very interesting, um, or maybe not even so interesting. There was a literary scandal in Germany, and as the person being text running text.com, I was able to actually intervene in such literary scandals. There was a book written by um, by Martin Walser, who's a German author, a uh, person I, whose literature and who personally I, I, I dislike very strongly, who had uh, who was about to release a novel that a very big prominent German newspaper had refused to preprint because they said this is anti-Semitic bullshit, it's full of anti-Semitic cliches. The main person, this book called Death of a Critic, was modeled on, is actually a real-life Jewish, <coughs> Marcel Reichernitzky, real-life Jewish literary critic of the, of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, of his newspaper, Auschwitz survivor, etc. So there was a big, uh, so the newspaper claimed, no, this is, this is full of anti-Semitic cliches, we won't print this, we won't uh, preprint this book. Now, a lot of people were talking about this book, but the problem was it was not released yet. And Sukum was the, the publisher, Sukum, biggest German publishing, serious German publishing house, uh, argued, 
yeah, it has to be read like there's a, there's a we have to stick by the tradition of the of enlightenment. So people have to be able to to make their own judgment about this. The problem was the book wasn't out, but they had mailed the PDF to journalists, so it appeared on the on the internet pretty soon. And then one day they hired a very expensive law firm to send cease and desist letters to just about um, um, anyone who linked or hosted that file. Um, so, just to, release, so just to read from the, from the, from the Texacom press release, so the idea was there's a big bit of background on, on, uh, on, on uh, Balzer. So, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, so much for the background. On June 15, 2002, an unspecified person named Inbox at text.com would serve the cease and desist order by Lübert Briesmann Rauch, the lawyer for Surkamp Verlag, claiming he or she had made available for download the PDF version of Death of a Critic, scheduled for release on June 26, which Surkamp itself had started to mail out for promotion two weeks before. Ironically, uh, they were mistaking the file. I had a Balsa PDF on the site, but it was a public domain book, something completely different. The charges and penalties Lübert Briesmann Rauch were trying to collect from the unspecified person in box were 100,000 euros in case the non-existing PDF does not disappear um, within five hours, up to 50,000 euros since um, text.com, which is registered and hosted in the US, was violating the Kennzeichnungsanforderungen of the German Telecommunications Act. So in Germany, if you have a website, you have to put in your tax number and your address. I don't think it applies to US websites. Um, and a legal fee of 1,200 euros for the delivery of cease and desist orders. So in the sense, in that sense, also like producing the livelihood of lawyers, I think publishers are very good in like it's big numbers if you add them up. And they also, um, furthermore, they announced an unspecified person named texts at text.com was going to be charged with a criminal offense before the Munich District Court, claiming he or she had referred to Mr. Walter as an asshole in a comment on a mailing list. Both their letter and the reply received from New York, I was living in New York at the time, are documented. So I, I, I wrote them a long letter back, by some Nicholas nickname, wrote them a letter back saying like, ooh, you know, I just got your mail, I don't know who you can, uh, are documented here. So the fact, and I think that's kind of, uh, to be able to, to be able, it's, it's one thing to, to just say fuck you, but sometimes you are in a position where you can say fuck you, and it has a bit more resonance just because the case is interesting. The fact that humanity won't be happy until the last copyright holder is hung by the guts of the last patent lawyer has already been stated elsewhere. But until then, humanity may at least regularly be amused by their blatant incompetence. Um, blah, 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 blah. So Text.com has decided to come up with something productive. Today, we're proud to announce the release of Balsa PHP, um, which is... Um, a 10,000 line PHP script that is able to generate the plain ASCII version of Death of a Critic. The script can be redistributed and modified, and of course linked to under the terms of the new general public license, but may not be run without written permission by Surkamp Verlag. Of course, reverse engineering the writings of senile German revisionists is not the core business of text.com, so Walzer PHP includes Make Walzer PHP, utility that can produce an unlimited number of similar free PHP scripts for any digital text. Um, on June 19th, Surkamp has apparently withdrawn their charges against the incriminated weblog and the fact that they haven't replied to my emails and they didn't look at my one-by-one -one pixel images I included indicates that they may have decided to stop wasting the time and bandwidth of text.com as well. Even mainstream media that ran the story had to admit that, spa that spamming journalists with e-books was probably not the best start to campaign against piracy. And um, there's, one more, there's one more sentence that I will read in a moment. So um, I think this Valsa PHP is somewhere in, the, in, the, in these folders. I don't know, I can look up where it is, but it's just, it's just a very, it's, in the, it's in somewhere inside text.com trash or somewhere. But these are all also very fine. So it's, there was just the idea that like, as you're operating in a field where a lot of these people who run publishing houses and who run law firms are technically very incompetent, it doesn't take so much. Like, okay, I've written a, a script that's open source, that generates your book, that this will completely throw them off track. And so I decided for the future of uh, 
for the for a future version of Tex.com to actually go a lot further in that direction. But I also couldn't resist to um, give my letter a last catch, which was um, still there's one question that remains wide open. When visiting text.com, weren't there lawyers one click away from the works of Adorno, also copyrighted by Surkamp? In fact, one of their best-selling authors, and also the one who explained how the tradition of enlightenment leads directly to the gas chamber? We have two concurring explanations for this. One is that their lack of competence is just way beyond our imagination. The other one would be they really don't care as long as it's a Jewish critic. I thought it had to be said. But I'm pre even though I don't know this, I'm pretty sure by now that this hint was what two years later attracted the uh, proprietors of, the, of a huge amount of works by uh, Adorno and Walter Benjamin and um, led to the, the instance of legal action that um, they served another they served another order which I which I didn't get they uh, tried to get an injunction at the court which, which I didn't get they they claimed they owned them owed them large amounts of money and even though I never went to court and I never paid a cent of their of their uh, of their claims the site got so popular in the in the in that moment and there were so many other things that were happening at that moment that required my time that at that specific point in time it was just there was just no point in continuing it the same way but and that's the second thing I wanted to show uh, today there was one idea I had how to do it the next time it was relatively close I was relatively close to releasing it I think in 2006 but then didn't because uh, certain aspects of it were maybe even more interesting than text.com itself on its own so I did something um, I think uh, Marcel if you navigate now I have to get there myself if you no, if you get to there's a there's a um, there's a there's in sites and no in, in pictures actually there's an underscore text.com spine or under, underscore text.com book my idea was basically um, I stopped serving books on text.com I just serve images that's the idea so that's the spine of a book and you find it's just the same name in spine as it plays that cover. So the idea would be, this is just a sample book, the idea would be no more books on text.com next time I'll, I'll launch this site, mm -hmm. but um, just images. Like this would be how the site looks. Um, and these things, as you could see just on the, on the previous screen, they have a small look inside button, like Amazon, like look inside. But all I store on the site are covers. I just provide covers. And of course the catch here is, that also someone who can be me or anyone else, I've written a reference implementation, has written a piece of software that is actually able to transform not just these book covers into the full text of all these books for a full library, just at a click of a mouse, but is also able to transform arbitrary images into arbitrary content. If you go to, in the sites folder, there's rolux.org and then something like dpng, So that was the idea, and then there's a there's this uh, there should be some underscore in gallery exactly in gallery. Uh, there's an underscore source code. I mean, anyone anyone who's I mean, if you zoom in on the image we've seen before the cover, anyone here with a bit of knowledge of uh, whatever steganography will be able to will tell me, no, sorry, you're not going to fit this full book in this cover. There seems to be a bit of texture, interesting kind of noise in the book. You may be able to hide information, but not the full book, not the complete works of Adorno in one image. I don't believe this. So it still works, but this is how it works. Um, this is some code I've written and rewritten many, many times. This is DPNG PHP. Um, so I tried to... I tried very hard to make this also fun to reverse engineer because that's not how, so the upper part is the license, open source license, and you have a bit of a binary blob here, and this is the PHP code. This is not how you would normally write PHP. Um, 
And then also, I mean, the joke is this is not this is not source code. This is if you rotate it, can you rotate it or make it larger and smaller? This is an image. So, of course, co the, the, you get the source code by copying it from the image. And if you run this code on this image, the result will be the source code printed of the image. In fact, which I had forgotten be before collecting my files was that the whole DPNG website was running on DPNG. So if you look at these, at these one, one directory further up, if you look at all these folders, the PHP folder or the HTML folder, they all just have PNGs inside. So basically, this, this steganography program DPNG would be the only piece of source of code actually running on the site. Everything else would be generated out of images, including the documentation and the FAQ for the thing. And uh, so one thing I, I, and I thought at the time, I'm not so convinced anymore, I thought at the time it would be an interesting avenue for people who run stuff like ARG or like tech.com. As you can argue, and I called it back at the time, I claimed that I tried to coin something that was called Luxembourg's Law, which says, um, for example, I made a five minute video that had subtitles that would instruct you how to uncompress DV, five minutes or less, three minutes, that had subtitles to instruct you how to, trans to um, transcode the video file into a full working copy of Final Cut, which worked. <laughs> um, so my idea was, damn, in the end, any piece of digital intellectual property, an e-book, is a number, just a large number. Any piece of my own intellectual property, anything I write, paint, draw, code, whatever, is another number. So the idea is, and there are different kind of versions of this law, but the gist of it is each piece of digital intellectual property is the exact mathematical difference of two other pieces of intellectual property, and these could well be mine. Or, in other words, as these things are just large numbers, it's quite unlikely that I will immediately generate them with a, with a small script, but in the long run, someone will. So that was the idea behind a lot of these... these, uh, these uh, I didn't find all the covers, but I'm pretty sure I had all the books encoded in these covers. It was just that the, this DPNG, this kind of this uh, steganography, uh, this having images that contain source code that then actually produce source code that would take book covers and spit out full books. It also worked for other things. It worked for MP3s, it worked for whatever. It was just uh, in itself too interesting. Um, and um, a few things, uh, and that also then led to a few, a few later projects. But um, in the end, I'm a bit less convinced about this. I mean, I'm sure the law holds. This law is uh, relatively obviously, uh, I think it's true, of course, these are large numbers. But I think you would have a hard time in court arguing that your thing that just happens to be able to transform into another thing is something other than a derivative work. So I think the main research on this field is still not done yet which would be how to create really meaningful pieces of intellectual property that just happen to collide with other people's intellectual property in, in, in interesting forms. Um, yeah, I think that's the basic, that was the basic idea. This was never really, it existed online for a while, um, but I think it was never, I was, there was even a release page we showed it. It was released on, almost released in 2006. Um, Yes. Crazy shit, man. Uh, let's see. Before we move on to the to the mass uh, spectacle, uh, would would anybody here like to harass this here individual with any very penetrating question or observation? Excellent. Uh, doesn't look alive to me. Does it? All right, you're good. Okay, let's move I on. I have a question. Oh, please do. Um, how does this work actually with the with these images that are much smaller than the text? Huh? Yeah, can it's too embarrassing. 
So, of course, these images are not, just to explain, these images are, of course, not big enough to contain the full book. But in image files, you can actually hide a lot of information between the visible stuff. So, it actually, what you see in the image is executable code. It runs stuff in the image. So, enormous, horrible security implications for that. So, you have to implement crypto for, or, and, and, and signing, code signing for that to have it work. Nightmarish Excuse security me. implications. Excuse me. I have oh. a question. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so my question is, uh, if you have a modern DSLR that takes a lot of a lot of data inside with a single picture, yeah. how much could you store in a 60 meg file or a image big, 6,000 times something something, or a, um, a picture taken with this? And lots of books, do you, do you no? know? I mean, do you know <laughs> the actual data that can be stored in a cover of uh, this magazine? The thing is, as I tried to explain, like the thing is, in the visual area of the image, you can only store so much. In this case, 60 megabytes or whatever. It won't be enough for the complete works of X, Y. But you can store a lot of things in the invisible in invisible places in the image, like the image is internally just a chunk of like, here's a bit and here's the next bit. Of course, you can squeeze something between these bits or add encrypted things as comments or metadata or... or um, yeah. Is, is information actually stored inside of a program and then an image is something you feed to it in order to make it spit out an, uh, a book? For example, could you feed it just one bit and then it spits out a book? Or is the data stored in metadata of the picture itself and then the program just reads that metadata? Very concretely, this program reads, I mean, it reads pixels. It makes very complex operations on pixels. It reads some very faint information of the image, combines it, and then executes this as code. And whatever this code does will produce. I mean, there was also a small CNN icon. I don't know what you, if you've seen it. This icon you could transform to the live CNN website of that day. So, of course, you can also do dynamic stuff. You can, it just, in okay. the end, it runs arbitrary code that it extracts my, from the image. My question is then, so you have the same program that executes all those images. It's not the program you generate together with an image to get the data. There's another program that generates all this stuff. Uh, but the program that reads the image yeah. is, is the same one for all It's, it's the image. same one for every image, and the results are so different because it can actually read, it can actually execute arbitrary code. And in case of the books, the books were actually appended, just kind of very naively appended to the image files in an encrypted okay. form uh, so that the image file would get big, but the image would remain. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Uh, can anybody repeat this? <laughs> this is good. I, oh, more. Sean should. Okay. Um, I find it really entertaining, but I was thinking about a, uh, a like a, this current situation, which is a, like a dark uh, kind of, I mean, there's lots of dark sides to it, but one in particular that I'm thinking of is uh, the, uh, these pattern matching algorithms. I mean, the idea of like, like uh, codifying intellectual property as a number uh, yeah, it's haha, but as I'm sure you, you already know, uh, um, the same way to bring it up in the discussion is uh, that a lot of these uh, these content hosting services are using pattern matching algorithms uh, to determine whether content that you're uploading is intellectual property or not. Um, so it's not like a kind of like personal subjective evaluation. It's a it's a, a algorithmic process. Uh, I only discovered because I was uploading monochrome videos to YouTube uh, and getting a lot of false positives, uh, saying that I was violating someone's intellectual property. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, I didn't know that uh, that this sort of activity was happening. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm just wondering, like aside from the mapping mm -hmm. or the translation, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is super interesting, but I'm also wondering, uh, like on the on the on the other other side of it, um, when uh, actually more and more of our stuff is uh, is is uh, being uh, placed on these places and then is subject to this kind of like interrogation is also like how we can, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, push the numbers over a little bit so they don't necessarily come up with a match. I don't know. 
So the way I understand what you're saying is like this issue of we can actually identify files just by computing or identify pieces of intellectual property just by computing their hash or just looking at them with a quick, fast, short computer program. And yes, I guess, I mean, and, and then provide an index, if you want, of all monochrome videos or all copyrighted books or, or and I guess this goes to show that an index of things is not a neutral thing. It totally depends on what you do with it. To give um, large numbers of people, independently of their, independent of their, uh, of their uh, income or their, or where they live on, on the planet, or the, just to give people access to this index of huge library or huge uh, video library, if you want. I think it's extremely empowering. Just the index, just to be given the map. That same index, of course, in, in the hands of uh, companies that are mostly interested in uh, mapping users' movements, patterns, patterns of interaction uh, onto sphere of commodities is an absolutely awful thing, even though it's maybe the exact same index. I think everyone who works on these indexes and identification uh, processes uh, has to be aware of the fact that these indices, that these databases of just just tell me how big the file is, just tell me how it looks, I'll tell you what it is, that these databases are not neutral at all. I mean, it totally depends on what you do. Oh, no, more hands. I think you've already spent your coupon, but no, I'm pulling around. Come on, give, give the man a power stick, please. Um, is there a reason you didn't just store a zip file in the metadata? Why do the whole complicated code executing code thing? It was just more fun in a way. It is really fun. It is really fun. I don't know if you noticed this, this, this script. It had to be exactly... 40 lines by 40 lines of 80. I, I know. I figured I'm going to bug like you afterwards just, about that. This is just, it's just, it was just more fun okay. in a way. It, it yeah, was okay. about something that's also kind of visually consistent in a way and kind of. Okay, mm. cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, of course, this is all, I mean, this is 2004 or something. This is not the, this was not the age where you would just every terabyte say, okay, dump it in one torrent, put it on the pirate bay. It was a tiny bit before that was, a, everything that happened since then was, a, was made a lot more sense. I'm not saying anything of this is practical. It may be funny. All right. Uh, thank you again, young man. Thank you.